We're in Philippians, chapter 2. <clears throat> We've been looking at the wherefore of the word wherefore, <clears throat> which is the first word in verse 9, and it is the bridge between the cross and the resurrection, the cross of verses 5 through 8 and the resurrection of verses 9 through 11. And we were talking about Paul uh, in verse 5 telling them, I mean, they're dealing with, he's dealing with <clears throat> divisions in the church, and he's not approaching it um, as, as I did for years as a pastor, uh, and, and kind of got my ideas, I guess, I don't really remember, but culturally, <clears throat> that there's a, that kind of what there's a myriad of problems <clears throat> and with it there is a myriad of answers you know like if you have a headache you take this aspirin if you get a cut you put this band-aid on you, you you kind of see what i'm saying whereas with paul <laughs> he, he kind of looked at the cross as boy that'll answer everything just kill him and they won't have <laughs> and that yeah, you know, and it just solves a whole lot of stuff. <clears throat> and then the, what's not solved, you put Christ in them then, and then that fulfills the rest of it. So I left off um, <clears throat> reading this. It says, Paul sets forth to this church, not just to, to sets forth Christ crucified to this church, not just to be an example to them, but that the very mind that took the Lord to Calvary can and should be at work in them, but presently it is not. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a, that's a matter of meditation. Um, <clears throat> we're Christians, we're saved, well, we already have everything that we need. Well, okay, we do, but we don't. I mean, we have the cross, but do we have the cross for salvation or dealing with our sins or, or, or dealing with our you know, punishment for sin or you know, all of this kind of stuff. And, and the, again, we did this in another class. Yes, 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 we, we know the Lord in all those ways. But we, do we have the spirit of the cross as our mind? And apparently they didn't. <laughs> apparently there was at least one church on the planet that didn't. <laughs> And so he sets forth Christ, and he sets forth Christ crucified, and he sets forth the spirit of the lamb as the thing that took Christ to the cross. And he says, let this be in you. Let this be in you. He doesn't. He doesn't get into all that stuff. He just says, look, you just, this, is, this is your responsibility. You must let this. I can preach it. You have to let it be in you. <clears throat> um, he's also seeking for them to see what God holds as most precious in us. In other words, Paul is seeking for the Philippians not just to get over their issue, using this issue <clears throat> as an impetus to help them see uh, what God holds as most precious in us, which is Christ, which is Christ crucified, which is, no, not just Christ crucified in some sort of ethereal way. Well, I got, I got Christ in me. I got Christ crucified. But he was setting those things forth in, you know, think not on your own things, but the things of others. And all, he was putting it, you know, in real practical terms, you know. As we say, he was putting boots on the theology, you know, work boots on the theology of it. And <clears throat> um, if, if these Philippians, if, if they could see... Uh, what God holds as precious in them, and if they love the Lord, maybe they would pursue that mind. You know, 
I mean, does that make sense? I mean, I've, ta I've said this before, but, you know, I go all over the world and I preach in conferences and stuff and, you know, well, different cultures and different languages and different, everything's different. Everything's different. But the one thing that is unchangeable is most of the people that came there really do love the Lord. Okay. So you have to go to their heart. You have to get to their heart. And you have to get to their heart for Jesus. Not for your program or your set of things or your agenda or your kingdom that you're trying to build or any of that. The only thing's going to really, really reach those folks. I mean, they, they'll follow your program and stuff like that, but, there, but there's nothing of eternal value to that if they do, if it's not Christ. So you have to just reach, reach into their heart and you have to touch their heart with their love for Jesus. And you'd be surprised how many times I've seen it just draw out people that... You know, they didn't like white people. They didn't like. They didn't like white. They didn't like male. They didn't like, you know, young. When I was young, they didn't like this or that. Or it was like everything was against me. And I just start talking about their Jesus, and they love him, so they'll come. You know, and not everybody does, but m but many of them will be drawn out. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this means that to God, uh, this is going to be one of those statements that can mess with you. This means that to God, Jesus does not have to be God in order to rule, meaning he was raised to lordship. But he does have to possess these particular attributes. Because he says, wherefore, based on this, he, he gave up things that we would have said, well, he's God. Uh, I probably got it in here written already, but you know, he's God. He's the best manager for the job. He should be Lord. He should be raised up and, and exalted to that. Or, or he, you know, um, he sees, you know, in ways that we don't. Or, you know, a million of, he's, he's God, for God's sake. Let him rule or whatever. And the Lord says, wherefore, because of these attributes... I have highly exalted him. Not because he's God. Doesn't have to be God. And you know what? The truth is, you read it, but I mean, he was, he's raised up, made to sit at the right hand of God. The man, Jesus Christ, it says. <laughs> Mediator between God and man. The man, that's the resurrected one he's talking about there. <clears throat> anyway, I don't want to argue all that that part, but, but there is a point to be made in that, and that, that, that is uh, uh, the point that you should consider is this resurrection that is being spoken of here may not be on the same basis that we have always thought it was. That's the main thing. And, and just take that to the Lord and go to the scriptures. God will show you if it's true and if it's not true. You don't want it and I don't either. All right. <clears throat> Um, since such a selfless nature glorifies God, therefore the Father glorifies it by raising it above all things in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. It glorifies him, so he glorified it. And again, we haven't given the full explanations of that if this is true. Right now you're just considering if, if I'm either an idiot or maybe I'm onto something here. <clears throat> this fact is important for we must not simply bow to the man on the throne, but must know to whom it is we bow and why it is that we are asked to bow. We are made to discover that every knee bows to the man of Philippians 2, 6 through 8. He becomes Lord. Again, this is most clearly made, to, uh, made known to us by the use of the word wherefore. After describing the self-abasement of Jesus, it then links those actions with his exaltation under the place of being Lord by the word wherefore. 
it is saying that this giving of himself to such a degree is the reason God has made Jesus to be Lord. Who do we bow to? Not just to the one who died, but the one who gives himself for others and believes in life out of death. We bow to the Lamb. <clears throat> and Revelation, doesn't it fully confirm that? I mean, you know, it, it, could, have, it could have looked any, way, any number of ways in the book of Revelation, yet that's the way it looks. Lamb, crucified lamb, amen, on the, on the throne. A lamb as though it had been slain. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. <clears throat> um, so let us be plain about this. This self-giving, self-abasing one is he that God has exalted to become Lord. It was the crucified whom God honors. It is the crucified whom every knee is to bow unto. All right. Now we're about to get into a section. I'm going to flip over to some other notes. <clears throat> um, but um, <clears throat> I hope this goes well because my other notes weren't as developed as these are. <clears throat> uh, but I'm, I, I'm about to launch into... Um, one of my major explanations that of why this is that he was exalted because of his humility, his self-abasement. Okay, I've already done that to one degree, but on this premise, the word wherefore being the linking word is saying be, wherefore because of this I have highly exalted him. Okay, so that should be sort of at least plain that I, what I'm trying to say, whether you believe it or not. Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's up to you and the Lord. You have to get with the Lord. <clears throat> now I'm going to go, I'm going to try to continue to prove um, that this self-abasement was the very impetus or the reason or the because of the, or the wherefore of his exaltation, all right? <clears throat> so keeping that in mind, but now your ear attuned to a new presentation or new reasoning, okay? You, you, you with me? We're gonna talk about something, we're gonna talk about the same thing, but a different thing that proves it. <clears throat> all right. So uh, my last words were, it was the crucified whom God honors. It is the crucified whom every knee is to bow unto. This should not be so difficult to embrace, nor should it stand as a foreign concept to us. We find in James 4, 6 and uh, Proverbs 3, 34 and many other verses in the Bible that God exalts the humble and takes down the proud. Now this is already, I can see how it's already slightly conflicted. It jumped ahead of my other notes. However, we must realize that this does not include just any form of humility. In other words, if God exalts the humble, he doesn't exalt just any form of humility. But that which is altruistic or solely for the benefit of others at its own cost. That's what altruistic means. It's the big word meaning. It's for the benefit of others at its own cost. <clears throat> All right. If you'll... Give me one second to find those other notes, if I can even remember where they are. I think it's right here. All right. <clears throat> so here we go. <clears throat> there is a pattern with God. I like patterns. It, it helps, it brings security to me to know that God has certain things that are patterns, okay? <clears throat> he is consistent uh, through both testaments. Ooh, then this is consistency. Through both testaments, this has never changed about God. It is as consistent as his nature. It has to do with what God exalts. And so I wrote down at that point two of my questions. 
What is it that God exalts? What is it that God exalts? And why does God exalt? They're similar questions, but they're slightly different to, to awaken something, uh, not in our mind, but certainly, you know, as we consider these things, to awaken things in our heart. <clears throat> so so um, this thing that is consistent about God that is that, that ne has never changed in either testament, it involves two things. Number one, he brings down what exalts itself. Now, now, just run quickly through the Old Testament and you'll see this is consistently. The kings, the different kings that did that. Uh, Saul, when thou wast humble in thine own eyes, da 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 and then, I mean, just keep going, man. You'll see it. It's there, and it, and it goes from start to finish all the way through. He brings down what exalts itself, and he exalts what is humbled. All right. Now, I wrote, we must, make, we must be clear. He does not bring down what is exalted. Good for you. He brings down what exalts itself. Jesus is exalted, and he's not going to bring him down because God, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Jesus didn't do that. That's important. It's important to the nature of the thing that we're saying is precious to, the, to God the Father. If we don't see that, then it's just, you know, well, you know, um, you know, then God will just, uh, and, and, you know, the same, the same is true of what is humbled. It is not what is humbled, but what humbles itself. It is not what is exalted, but what exalts itself. If, it, if you're exalting yourself. All right. Uh, I <clears throat> have several scriptures here you might want to keep your place in philippians gosh i hope we get down the road a little way with this <clears throat> uh, book of luke and in luke we should be able to hit several scriptures and we may not linger long <clears throat> luke 17 that we'll start with All right, Luke 17, verse 33. <clears throat> okay, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose, lose his life shall preserve it. And in other scriptures, it says, lose his life for my sake. Okay. <clears throat> um, so here... Veiled in this, as it were, it's not really veiled, but veiled in this <clears throat> is Jesus talking. And, and he is addressing one of the most powerful, one of the most um, overriding factors, one of the things that is going to end up being the greatest thing, the, the masterpiece of God, but to us it is veiled in just another teaching, another angle, another sort of area. Well, you know, you need to pray and, you know, be sure and go to church and, oh, by the way, be humble and just another, you, see, you kind of see what I'm saying, it's just an to, to many of us, when we read it and when we continue on as Christians, well, it's, a, it's one of those, but it's not that big. Okay. Um, but it's big to Jesus. How big? Well, the verse in front of it says, remember Lot's wife. <laughs> yes. Luke uh, 17, 33. And then I wanted to compare that or, or add to that uh, Luke 
For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Okay, there's two different spirits right here in a sense. Whosoever shall seek to save his life, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. If you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. The Son of Man came to seek to save your life, not his own. Hanging on the cross, mockery. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Absolutely right. He cannot, he will not save himself. He, he, you know, as God, he has the power to come down from that cross. If you're the son of God, come down. Uh, he has the power to come down from the cross. But as God, he will not do that himself. Either God will raise him from the dead or he won't be raised. And the scriptures never say Jesus raised from the dead. It says he was raised from the dead. <laughs> you say, well, that's a, you just, you know. Splitting hairs there. No, 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 not in light of the very reality that we're talking about. It would be impossible for him to raise himself. It's not in his nature to do that. And in fact, it's not in this law of God that if, look, if I'm seeking to save myself, then I'll lose. And so he goes, you know, whosoever seeks to save himself, seeks to save. Okay, here he seeks to save Himself. Here's Jesus' word. Son of man came to seek to save others. Two different things. Two opposite poles of reality. Two completely different natures. One self-centered, thinking about its own self, and the other other-centered. God and other-centered. All right. Still in Luke, let's go back a few chapters. Chapter 14. Verse 11, <clears throat> Luke 14, 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right, again, simple terms. I mean, we can take this, we can take this as, okay, um, well, you really... You shouldn't be prideful in, in your ministry and you shouldn't, you know, so don't seek to exalt yourself, okay? Not realizing, and, and maybe you yet don't because we still haven't applied this to our verses in Philippians, but this is, this is the wherefore, this is the, this is, this is the God answer to resurrection, to exaltation. Um, with that now, just considering that one there, let's see, um, is um, Luke 18, verse 14. <clears throat> okay, this is the Pharisee and the publican, you know, and the... the uh, the, the publican went in and uh, he cried out and, you know, I'm not worthy to this and that and, you know, wouldn't even lift his head up. And the Pharisee came in and says, you know, I've been, I have done this. I, I sound familiar? Isaiah 14, Lucifer. I have done this and I have done, I have twice daily in the week. I give tithes I, of all that I possess. And Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man, talking about the publican, the Republican, sorry, no, no, no. <clears throat> I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For, ju here's justification, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right. First uh, Peter. First Peter chapter five. <clears throat> Verse six. First Peter five. Verse six. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
that he may exalt you in due time. All right, this goes along with uh, James. James is right in front of 1 Peter. James chapter 4. <clears throat> Yeah, it's funny, the, in the Gospels, it's always Peter, James, and John, and Peter, James, and John came, but in, in the epistles, it's James, Peter, and John. <laughs> uh, verse 4, uh, so, sorry, chapter 4, verse 6. Um, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. <clears throat> All right, um, a couple of things but the main thing to notice is um, that there is this interplay between humility and exaltation. It's so important. It's so small at this point in our, you know, it's such a, oh, it's, it's just one of a billion little things that we have to, you know, but there's this, but, but we have to see that there's an interplay and it's going all the way through the Bible. I didn't give you all the scriptures that say this, but you know for a fact that it's said all the time in the New Testament as well as examples were given all through the Old Testament of, of this very principle that, that God has never changed about in either Testament. <clears throat> all right. So it's, so if we're going to comprehend Philippians correctly, we need to see the interplay that's happening here. <clears throat> All right, the second thing to notice, particularly in verse 6 here, is uh, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. <clears throat> Some of you remember I, when I was, I don't know, I was told a story, I was really young in the Lord, and I read that scripture, and I went, you know, this doesn't say the devil resists you when you're proud. It says God does. And I, I said in my mind, you know, this pride thing is, is an enemy of me because uh, when I go there, it is not the enemy that's getting me. It's God. And that's my father. But I'm, I've put myself in a position of being his enemy. And that is not, I'm a son by Christ, you know what I mean? I mean God made me that, and I need to live up to that by, Christ, by the same Christ that, <clears throat> that he gave and put inside of me as my life. God resisteth the proud, not just Satan. And so, you know, uh, could, could you say that if you go off into pride, you probably open the door to Satan. Okay, well, guess what? Then you got God and Satan working together and you're the bad guy. <laughs> wow, you know. So, so these, that sort of gives us an idea that maybe this is bigger than what we think. All right. <clears throat> now I'm gonna go back to reading. <clears throat> We've said that there are two consistent things about God. He brings down what exalts itself, <clears throat> and he exalts what is humbled. You could say this another way. You could say that, that another way. He removes that which is destructive, that which is not his nature, that which will subjugate everyone else to its own purposes. Okay, that's, that's pretty big then. God brings down <clears throat> the prideful. He, he lifts, he exalts. And that's a pretty powerful word there. He exalts the humble and he brings down the prideful. Okay, he removes. It is out of of order with God's realm. And he, re he, he actively works to remove it. He resists it. Okay. 
and he removes that which is not his nature because isn't this what he's trying to describe that his nature in Philippians 2 that he humbled himself that he 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 um, um, uh, made himself of no see I mean those are those are not words he made himself of no reputation he humbled himself they're not there he's he's be, he's becoming how do I say this? he's it's what he's not becoming I mean that's and that's, that's, that's the big thing that's working in God's mind in Philippians 2. Well, God doesn't have to remove that which is destructive or that which is not his nature or that which will sub subjugate others for his own purpose. He doesn't have to remove that in Christ because he makes himself, he humbles himself. He gets low and becomes as a servant. He becomes obedient even unto the death of the cross. Everything about him gets lower and lower, but that's not the end of it. Because God sees that. He sees what he honors. He sees that nature. He sees that son. And, and he's going to exalt it. It won't be long. It'll only take a few verses. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Five through nine and boom. I mean, five through eight and then nine. And then we're off to the races. <clears throat> okay, so we're, so what if we don't understand this? What if we don't have any clue of this? Or what if we've heard the teaching, but it is not having this mind in us? Then many times we will be on the God removing the destructive end of this thing and God removing that which is not his nature and God not honoring something that will subjugate everyone else to them. Well, that's what he's, that's what Paul is trying to communicate to these Philippians. It's big. Let me continue. <clears throat> it would be good for us to see Jesus' resurrection in light of these things, in light of these things. Notice that he was not just resurrected from death. Okay, okay. Lord help me. Okay, so here's the here's the tomb, and Jesus is you know laying down in here, and he's he's dead. Y'all probably can't see that because of the camera. It's a tomb, and Jesus is laying down dead. Okay, but all of a sudden God does something, and he's up, and now he's not dead. He's raised from the dead. Woohoo, folks, that just doesn't even come close. He wasn't just raised from the, resurrected, and I, my wording is very particular, resurrected from death. Oh, I was in death, and now I'm not. That's what happened to Lazarus. Jesus was raised up, ascended into heaven, exalted to lordship, in lordship became lord of all. Why? Well, I, I, I will be dealing with all of that as we go. We're going to really look at that. All right, so, so notice that he was not just resurrected from death. He ascended into heaven. He was exalted to lordship. That's a pretty big exaltation. We have seen that God exalts what is humbled. That that is a general principle by which he operates, right? We've seen that. I mean, can you at least sort of agree that that seems to be a general thing with God? <clears throat> okay, our Philippian scriptures in verses 6 through 8 are showing how much or to what degree Jesus humbled himself. It's not just showing that he humbled himself. It is trying to communicate also the degree that God became incarnated 
gave up his godly attributes and all that in, in the sense that we talked about the last time we talked to this. In other words, it was an extreme humbling for God. Right? Amen. Okay. <clears throat> um, our Philippian scriptures are showing us how much he humbled himself. Well, if God exalts the humble, then why shouldn't we see Jesus' exaltation and his lordship as the degree God has exalted him based on his humility? That's taking a simple subject, like, you know, this little subject over here of, you know, humble yourself or, and he'll exalt you, exalt yourself. It's taking a little subject over here and it's saying it's the whole premise of death and resurrection. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. <clears throat> All right, so, well, let me, I'm getting close in time and here. Um, I'm going to read that last sentence again. Well, if God exalts the humble, then why shouldn't we see his exaltation and his lordship as the degree God has exalted him based upon the degree of his humility? I, I, I know I need to go on. But I just keep seeing that little bitty concept of, well, just I see it as a Christian little thing we've added to our repertoire, you know. And, okay, well, I'll be humble this time or whatever. Not realizing that you're playing around with eternal dynamite, you know, dunamis, you know. You're, this is... This is the release into glory that is not some little thing. It is the definition of the resurrection and of the exaltation, of the ascension. <clears throat> but we don't see it as that. So we humble ourselves very little. You understand what I mean when I say that? What we, we, we don't, how about this? We humble ourselves not so often. If we really understood it, if we really saw that, if we really, if that gripped our heart, we would go, oh my God. Th number one, this is Christ. Number two, this is the way to resurrection, exaltation. And I, and I say all that in the right spirit because we'll see we're not even in that neighborhood and God help us to get as far as that. But we're going to see that God is not going to resurrect and exalt and give dominion to anything short of that spirit. We've got a long way before we get to that. <clears throat> All right, so why do we just see it as something that should have happened, talking about the resurrection? Why do we just see it as something that should have happened or rightfully belongs to the Son of God or as him being the best qualified to run the universe or as the resurrection as victory over the cross? And that last one peeves me, but I... It's, well, it's, it's more common thought than you would think that people really see the resurrection as the victory when God exalted what he, he called the victory. And that's, that's, I mean, I, that's universes away, but it's still in this study. It is. <laughs> So what did I, I just mention? Uh, why do we just see it as something that should have happened? Well, the, it, well, of course Jesus was raised from the dead. Of course it should have happened. Well, why? 
Well, it, you know, here we go. Well, he's the son of God. Well, what if God didn't raise his son in the sense of what we think he raised? I mean, you know, yes, but I mean, it's what I said in the beginning. Um, we need to not just worship the man on the throne. We need to know who we worship and why, why we're told our knees should bow. Well, we go, we do it in reverence. Well, he's a king, you know. You know. You know we Americans aren't as good at the, as the English at that, but, you know, they, you know. Uh, he, you know, it's a, he's a king. Oh, okay. Are you bowing to the position, to the title? Well, he's a king. Well, you know, there have been a lot of kings who are just ugly, mean people. You know. Well, but he's still the king. <laughs> and that's the way it is in some countries. If they're the king or queen or whatever, that's the way you do it. Well, I think in general, I think there is something inbred in us that says, okay, well, if there, but that's not what God's trying to get us to honor in Philippians 2. That is not what God's after. All right. So, so we have to examine ourselves in light of the true meaning of those scriptures in Philippians. We have to ask ourselves those questions. We, and in asking ourselves our, those questions, we have to not dodge them or make um, uh, c cover up or, or hide things. We have to say, I just flat don't know or I don't see this or I need to see this or, you know, Lord, um, you know, I will continue to honor you on a much lesser basis than you deserve and... You don't deserve that out of me. So, Holy Spirit, you've got to reveal the true one on the cross, you know? And, mm, all right, so, all these question marks. The last three sentences all have question marks. <clears throat> so, what if all that, all that glory in Philippians 2, 9 through 10... I love this. I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit allowed me to write it down like this because he spoke it to me sometime back, all of this. And, uh, and I, I said, Holy Spirit, I'm not going to write it down because if I write it down, I'll think I'll have it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here because you've, just, you've breathed such beautiful things to me about Jesus, and I'm, I'm not going to write it down. I'm going to ask you to please work it in me so that one day it'll be, it'll come from inside me and not upon me. And he did that. And in many of these words, I, I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit did his job. All right, so this is just my last sentence I may make a few more comments but what if all that glory in Philippians 2 through 9 that God wherefore God hath highly I mean look at the glory level hath highly exalted him and given him a name above do you hear this exalted like it is in contrast to the to verses 5 through 8 which is, if you listen, if you read, if you look, it's all showing Jesus doing this humbling. On, on this end, it is, wherefore God hath highly exalted and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, heaven, earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and this will please because the crucified is seated on the, th on the throne. All right. <clears throat> so what if all that glory in Philippians 2, 9 through 10 was as simple as God exalts the humble? <laughs> Whew. 
what if that was it? And he does so in accord with our level of self-abasement. You know. Can you can you see uh, can you see Jesus there? He's so patient, and uh, and James and John's mom comes to him and says, "You know, I just want to talk to you about my sons. They're good boys. You know, they followed you all this time. the The Lord has been with them too." in big ways. And I just would like for you to consider letting one of them sit on your right hand and the other one on your left hand. Just, just pray about it, Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus says, there must have been right there with her, behind her skirts. Get him, Mom. <clears throat> and he says, he looks at them and says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And their response, well, yeah, sure. What's it, what is it? What's it going to be? You know? <clears throat> yeah. Coca-Cola? Jesus says, you surely will. You, you definitely will. But why did Jesus say that? I mean, one of the one of the one of the most challenging things that you can do is is go through the Gospels and and every time somebody asks Jesus a question and it says and Jesus answered, look at that answer closely and go, would that make sense to me if I was there? And in most cases, I I, I had to say no. I, why? heck is he saying that of all why, why don't you just say what we we're talking about here you know just say it <laughs> and uh, and when you realize that that's not what you would expect him to say then say holy spirit you're gonna have to show me why he would say that what's in his heart what because he clearly sees things straight well in that case they said, can he sit on his right hand and left? And his, he, he answered, like he does many times, he answers with another question. He does. And he says, well, can you drink the cup? Well, that, the cup is the cross. Okay. So why would he say that? You know, why not say, well, you know, I'll, I'll pray about it. Or, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm, when I get back up there with my dad and the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about it. Or, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, all sorts of things that we would go, well, you know, if you went to the pastor and you said, well, could I do so and so? And you go, well, and he'd say, well, I'll pray about it or I'll check with the board or, you know what I mean? I mean, those are, that's a common answer. Jesus goes, well, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? You go, sure, sure. Anything to get to the throne. <laughs> <clears throat> But Jesus knows what he's saying, doesn't he? He says, he says you're going to have to go low before you get high. You're going to have to go low. You're going to have to, you're going to have to um, not just be brought low. You're going to have to make yourself of no reputation. You, you'll be brought low, and you'll fight it every step of the way. How about you already get low, and then, you know, you know what I mean? If you're already low... Then they go, well, we're going to take away. We're gonna, well, you ain't really got much. You know what I mean? You're so low. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you're already so much. Like, they come and go, well, we'll, we'll just take away your, uh, I guess, yeah, never mind. You know. <clears throat> but, you know, it's, it's, it's like, well, I do have these things and, you know, better not try to take my stuff and not, not take my position or my, my, you know, stuff. And, and all this reaction to that because we don't have that mind already in us. It goes, you know, Jesus said, they come up mass for your cloak. You don't go, heck no, man, I need that cloak. It's, it's winter. Have you, 
It's fixing to get really cold here, you know. God would not want me to be cold. On and on and on, okay. Um, <clears throat> that, um, God doesn't want you to be cold. But don't you believe that if you'll humble yourself, he'll take care of you? Has anybody ever given something away that you really were not one, you wanted that thing, but God said give it, and you, were re you wrestled with it and everything, and then all of a sudden freedom came, and you gave it. And every once in a while in your soul, it'd kind of go, oh, but then you'd go, get, you know, you'd move back in, into Ruth instead of Naomi, and you go, no, this was the right thing, you know, and there's a release and a joy and and what begins to happen a lot of times is God brings you something better. There's an exaltation that takes place there, you know. And uh, I mean, I've seen that in a million ways, but I mean, I see that example with my wife and her car, you know. And we had a, a car given of God and stuff. And, but the Lord, because of giving and pouring out on her part for so many people, the Lord even blessed her with a better car, and I'm just, and she's like, look, I don't, her response is, Lord, I don't need this good of a car, okay, I'm just fine with what I have, and da, 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 da. That's where you have to also receive from the Lord, the giver, the exalter, you know, it's just, and it, and it pleases him to do that, but it doesn't please him when we're grasping after it. All right. We'll, we'll stop. Father, we just thank you for your spirit, and we thank you that he is our uh, guide, and he is our teacher, and, and he doesn't just teach us Bible lessons, Father. You said he came not to declare himself, but to, but to reveal Christ unto us. And we want to know Jesus, so we get closer to the Holy Spirit. Because he will not speak of himself. He will glorify Jesus. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your heart. And we thank you for your word. And we thank you for gathering us together tonight. And those that you chose to have here tonight or on Skype or that will listen to this later. Bless each and every one of them, Lord, with an increase of your heart, Father your heart for your son and for the this reality of Christ crucified we ask it in Jesus name amen all right we're dismissed don't you know go home and let's say this if you're driving home be careful and